I was sitting on the tarmac at Reagan National Airport this morning at 5.45 a.m. I looked out the little airplane window, and there was the U.S. Capitol gleaming against the inky pre-dawn sky. And I was thinking about a conversation I had with one of my friends, who asked me what I was going to speak about when I came here. I gave him a brief overview. At the end of that, he looked at me and said, you can't say that. I said, why not? He said, if you go to Andrews and you talk like that, they will never invite you back. This morning, 5.45 in the clarity that you have when you first wake up, I was thinking, I'm 54 years old. Andrews University has never invited me to come and speak before like this. If life goes on as it has, I'll be 108 before you invite me back anyway. What have I got to lose? So friends, this morning, I'm here with no notes, no fears, and I have absolutely nothing to lose. Shall we get started? This should be fun. My point this morning is very simple, although the ramifications are rather broad and complex. My point is this. Christianity as a faith cannot simply be lived out as private piety. It must impact our attitudes and our actions in the public square. Private piety must lead to our actions and attitudes on public policy. Jesus and politics, you could sum it that way. This has become a very controversial idea within the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I know because I speak about this often, and I often get a lot of blowback. But when you think about it, it makes sense. Think about your favorite Bible stories, the first Bible stories you were told by your parents. Stories about Moses confronting Pharaoh, Joseph, the Daniel. Think about Esther. All these stories that really are the key stone of your early religious education. All of them involve followers of God acting in the public square. And then think about the life of Jesus himself. The first thing that Jesus did when he announced that he was the Messiah was he read from the book of Isaiah. And the first things that he read was, I have come to set the captives free. Now, some people read that and say, what he's really talking about here is some sort of metaphysical, metaphorical idea. He's not really here to set the captives free. Really? Think about some of the things that he did in his life. Not only did he free the woman caught in adultery, not only did he raise up the status of the Samaritans, but he did something that is very confronting and very interesting. He went through the temple and cleared it with a whip of the money changes. Ellen White, talking about this example, had this to say. She said, Christ saw the exploitation of the poor and saw that something must be done. You know, our parents always tell us, act like Jesus, right? Be careful what you wish for for your kids. Imagine if we really acted like Jesus. Whew. Christianity, friends, is not about adopting middle-class values and acting in a polite way that makes everybody comfortable. Christianity is about following Jesus Christ. 
Our early Adventist pioneers understood this. That's why they jumped into the hottest issue that this nation has ever faced, and that is the abolition of slavery in the aftermath. Over 500,000 Americans died fighting over this issue. You can't get a hotter issue, and we're still dealing with the aftermath. And yet Adventists took their faith and their understanding of Jesus' example, and they went out into the public square. They fought against the alcohol industry. They stood up for religious freedom. Over, they collected over 500,000 names on a petition to advance religious freedom. And then Ellen White came to a, a group just like you, and she had this to say. She said, youth, have you dreams that you dare not express, that one day you will stand in legislative, you'll sit in legislative chambers and make the laws of the land. There is nothing wrong with these aspirations. Aim high and spare no effort to reach the mark. Oh, I wish there were more Adventists who've gone into public service. Do you know how hard it is to knock on the door of congressmen and senators' offices knowing that they don't even know who we are? It's so much easier when you meet another Adventist. There aren't many, but I praise God for every one of them. But friends, I, and I, I should say, Dr. Miller, if all I do when I'm out here is get one of these students to think about a life in public policy, serving their country and serving their community, that will be terrific. But I want to challenge you to do one other thing. This country does not need more democratic politicians. This country does not need more Republican politicians. We've got plenty of those. What this nation needs are Christians. Christians dedicated to public policy who don't care what the party orthodoxy is. They're willing to follow Jesus no matter what to the logical conclusions that the gospel takes them to. Are you with me? Friends, if your morality and your ethics lines up perfectly with the Democratic Party, you are not a Christian, you are a Democrat. If your ethics and your morality lines up perfectly with the Republican Party, you're not a Christian, you're a Republican. I don't need a world full of Democrats and Republicans, friends. This world needs Christians. And they are so hard to find. My presentation this morning has three chapters. Each chapter has a story, a lesson, and an application. Chapter one, Virginia smiling. I got a dream job. My job was administrative director of the cardiovascular division at the University of Virginia. Every morning I woke up and I drove up a nice windy road past colonnaded mansions, past Monticello, into the University of Virginia, where my office was near the hallowed grounds. Arguably, the most beautiful college campus in the United States. I worked with some of the brightest minds. One of my colleagues in an adjacent department eventually went on to win the Nobel Prize in Medicine just a few years after I worked there. Amazing people. My wife, on the other hand, drove south through little winding roads to a one-room schoolhouse. And in that schoolhouse, she taught multi-grade, one through eight. She was the coach. She was the school nurse. She was the counselor. She was sometimes the janitor, too. She had beautiful students, but one of them stuck out to her. I'll call that student Jane. Jane came from a very difficult background. Her parents had split up. There had been a lot of <clears throat> problems. She now lived with one of her parents in a trailer park. Now, I know that in the United States, we have a word for people who live in trailer parks. But I want to tell you this morning, there is not a single person on this planet 
who is trash. Are you with me? This little girl was amazing. But during the trauma of everything that she went through, she started sucking her thumb, and she sucked her thumb so incessantly that it pushed her teeth straight out. And then one of her teeth got hit and turned black. Because of that, she didn't smile. My wife didn't think too much about it until one day she gave a lesson on heaven. She said, in heaven, the lions will lie down with the lambs. Kids didn't really care. In heaven, you'll see dead relatives again. Oh, well. In heaven, you'll all have mansions and there'll be streets of gold. Kids don't care about that stuff. And she said, in heaven, our bodies will be made new. And as soon as she said that, Jane's little hand reached right up to her mouth. I went, oh. That's when Lisa realized that being a Christian teacher is a very different job than just being a teacher. She called up a local dentist, Christian dentist, who fixed the black tooth, put a cap on it. Then she contacted a Christian orthodontist who said, I'll fix the teeth for half price. You come up with half, I'll come up with half. And that's how my wife got into the fundraising business. Eventually she got the money, and before she left that school, Jane was smiling. The biggest, goofiest, brace-faced smile you ever saw beautiful smile. As Christians, we have a unique obligation. And that obligation is not simply to do our jobs. We're here to fulfill a mission. Today, as I speak and you sit here, there are 262 million children around this world who have no chance to go to school. And I'm glad you've brought your phones with you, madam. And I'm glad you're looking at it because I'm going to need you to look at your phone in a second. Because the Seventh-day Adventist Church and ADRA together is doing a global, a global campaign for kids who are out of school. And what I want you to do right now is everybody pull out your phones. I want you all looking at your phones for a minute. Well, you can stay on them as long as you want, but look at them for a minute. Who's got their phones? I mean, half of you have been looking at them. I know you got them. I want you to go to adra.org forward slash in school. Can you do that? adra.org forward slash in school. Adra is doing a global petition on behalf of children who don't have an opportunity to be in school. I don't want to come here and just talk. I want to do something. Let's do it together. Let's raise our voices. Enough of this Christianity in a box where we sit around thinking and talking and doing nothing. adra.org forward slash in school. The purpose of this petition is if you sign that, I can go into offices on Capitol Hill and say, guess what? People do care about the kids around the world who are denied a basic education. This is what we know about kids who are denied a basic education. We know that they're much more likely to live in extreme poverty if they're girls. They're much more likely to get married young. They're much more likely to die young. Denying a kid an education denies them a chance at life. I'm just curious. Adra.org slash in school. Who's, who's gone there? Oh, boy, this is lame. I thought this was meant to be the activist generation. Oh, yeah, everyone's going to do something. Put up your head. What's that? Your Wi-Fi doesn't work. Are you joking me? How are you guys surfing while I'm talking then? Are you downloading stuff before you get to chapel? Come on, I saw you guys. You know, I'm not blind. I'm standing up here. I've got 20, 20 vision with glasses. Adra.org slash in school. Nobody's been able to get on that? Oh, yeah, some of you have. Top of the class, A. 
Friends, tonight I fly to Malawi. The reason I fly to Malawi is because we're setting up a new program where we are partnering schools in the North American division with schools that are in great need in Malawi. The idea is we partner what we have with what we need. Oh, I hope you guys sign that petition. It kind of breaks my heart that you guys aren't doing that. Fool. Wi-Fi. How could you not have Wi-Fi at a university? <laughs> what are you guys doing, class? Do you actually listen to uh, lectures? Oh, for goodness sake. I didn't know anyone did that anymore. Anyway, when you get home, it's not hard to find adra.org slash in school. In school, right? Adra in school, if you just Google that. Please do it. Do it because it's the right thing to do. Do it because I'm going to be going to your congressman's office, your senator's offices. I want to be able to say that somebody cares about this issue here in Michigan. Chapter 2. Finding family. Last summer, a year ago, I stood with my back to the Yellow River in a city called Langzhou, China. It's in northwest China. I was looking at a garden with a little boy. Five years before that, that little boy had lost his mom and his dad at this spot. He'd lost them, and for the last five years, he'd wondered, why do other boys and girls get a mom? Why do other boys and girls get a dad? Why do other boys and girls get a family? And I don't. Five years of wondering and searching. But on this day, something big had changed. On this day, after five years, he'd finally found his mom and his dad. Maybe to his surprise, and a little bit to my surprise, it turned out. I'm his dad. And, his, and my wife is his mom. Because just that morning, we'd completed the adoption process. About 25% of Christians think about adopting a child. About 2% do. You're planning out your lives right now. Just an idea for you. If you ever get the chance, do it. Don't want to cry, but it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. That little boy has changed our lives in a thousand ways, and 999 of them are really good. The other one's a bit off, but (laughs) no, it's a beautiful thing. So there's a movie that's out called One Child Nation, a documentary we decided because it's about the policies that resulted in children uh, 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 being aborted and children being uh, abandoned, that we better go along and just see it. We understood a little bit more about the background. So that's how my wife and I ended up in a cinema in uh, downtown Washington, D.C. The film is called One Child Nation. Do not take a date to this film. It is bracing. It is confronting. And there's two characters out of that film that struck me like a bullet. The first character was a woman who worked her life as an abortionist for the Chinese communist regime. She is now an old lady, and she was on camera grappling with her conscience. And she looks right at the camera, and you know, in China, they don't sugarcoat stuff like we do in the United States. In the United States, we've come up with all kinds of language and words so that we don't deal with the reality of the situation. She said, in grappling with her conscience. How do I live with myself? I killed those babies, didn't I? 
This is a Chinese communist woman who was bathed in an ideology that said, this isn't just neutral, this is good. And yet somehow she has the language to admit the reality of the situation, while many of us in the United States lack the language. Then a second character in the film, or interviewee, is an artist. One day that artist was out taking photographs, and he noticed some yellow bags under a bridge. He went to the yellow bags to see what, they was in them, what was in them. They were labeled medical waste, and when he pried them open, there were little babies. A uh, dump there from an abortion clinic. That artist, bathed in an ideology of utilitarian ethics, has taken it upon himself to paint the portraits of these little lives so that they have the dignity of remembrance. Every year around the world, about 50 to 60 million children, young human beings, babies, are killed. The vast majority of those that are killed are healthy babies with healthy mothers conceived consensually. That's according to the abortion industry's own statistics here in the United States. I know it's not popular to talk about. I know that it's difficult. I know that it's hard, but I've chosen to talk about it. I've chosen to talk about it because every one of those little babies has a father. And one day I'm gonna see that father who made them and crafted them in his own image. And I'm gonna have to give an account for what I did while the killing went on. And so will you. My appeal to you, as you live in a world where things are complicated, I get it, where you'll be unpopular if you speak out, where every sound bite has been honed, is to confront your own conscience in front of a God of awesome, awesome holiness and power. For the more on that topic, I published an article in Compass Magazine that covers it in much more detail. If you want more detail, please go ahead and access it. What Adventist Christians can learn from Chinese communists. Chapter 3, Finding Home. It was a very hot day on the tropical island of Penang, Malaysia, where I grew up. There was a knock on the door. I ran to the door and I opened it. And there standing in front of me was a man in rags. In rags. I thought, what's this all about? And he started yabbering. I couldn't understand a thing. I thought, oh, I know. He wants some money. So I ran to get my mom. I should say this was a few years ago. Nowadays, I answer the door for myself. Yeah. And my mom came out, and I thought she'd do what any good Christian person would do. She'd hear the guy out and give him a buck, right? He's a buck. Good luck. Hope things pick up for you. God bless you. Haven't you done that before? See somebody? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's a good thing to do, right? You didn't just walk by them. That would be callous. But my mother didn't do that. Instead, she did something that was just absolutely insane. She said, hold on, because she couldn't understand him, got a friend over, started translating, and she said, let me hear your story. So this was the man's story. He'd worked his whole life on the railroads. It'd come time to retire. When he had a choice when he retired, he was illiterate, I should add, they gave him a choice. Do you want a cash payout or do you want a, a pension? Well, his nephew said, take the cash payout, uncle. Come, then come and live with me, and then you'll have the best of both worlds. So that's exactly what he did. One day he came home. The cash that he'd kept in a little safety box was gone. His nephew was the only person who had any access to it. So he confronted his nephew. His nephew said, get out of here. And since then, he'd been wandering the streets of, of Penang, homeless, 
ragged, hungry, and desperate. That's why my mom said something that I will never forget. She said, we have a room out the back of our house. We use it for storage. But in old times, it had been used for, for servants' quarters. Why don't we clean out that room, and why don't you come live at our house? You know, I've heard thousands of sermons in my life. I actually heard quite a few just across the way here because I was a student here for a year. I grew up in the tropics and then it got cold here and I, I didn't know it could be that cold, so, <laughs> so that's why I lasted one year. No. Um, I've heard a thousand sermons. I've forgotten nearly all of them. But there's one thing that I'll never forget. So when my mother said to a homeless man, come and live with us. Life's short, we only get so much time to help. Friends, right now, in the United States, we have a lot of people who are looking for a home. Many of them have found a home here in the United States, but they face constant danger of being deported. I am an immigrant to the United States. I often talk about this. People say, well, why don't they just get their paperwork together? Right? It's a good question. I just want you to know, because I immigrated to the United States, so I know the system. I'm the son of a doctor and a teacher. I've got pretty good, uh, uh, what you might call, uh, form processing skills. I know how to work systems. It took me seven years to get a green card. Do you guys have any idea how complicated the system is? Many of the people who are now undocumented could have regularized their citizenship at one point or another if they were, doc if they were like me, a lawyer, and understood the system. They had money for a lawyer. If they spoke English better, had greater facility, a thousand things. But they were poor, not all of them, but many. They were working hard. They didn't have access to the system. They didn't do something that's a crime of, of evil or hatred. They just wanted to stay here and build their lives. And for many years, they went ahead and built those lives. In the law, there's a doctrine called equitable estoppel. Equi equitable estoppel means that you can't watch somebody invest and build something and wait till they've built it, knowing that they exist, and then come in and take it away from them. That's not fair. And yet that's exactly what we're doing. There is not a single Seventh-day Adventist church that I speak in that I don't have people come up to me afterwards who are undocumented. Many of them are very beautiful wonderful, amazing people who've contributed to society and have children who are born in the United States who are United States citizens. There is no reason other than animus to kick those people out. Yet most of us are watching this happen silently. We're polite. We're nice people. We want people to like us. I don't want people to like me I mean, I guess better to be liked than not, I suppose. But that's not our point to be here. Jesus said that they hated him, and if you follow him, they're going to hate you. You want to be liked? Don't follow Jesus. Are you with me? So a church entity asked me to, to look into this because of our members being deported. And one of the things I found is that the uh, U.S. Uh, ICE service has a policy. And it's actually a policy drawn from the Bible, believe it or not. You see, in the Bible, there was something called sanctuary cities. Then in the English common law, they had developed that to have a sanctuary within a church for people who are accused of a crime. And today, except in unusual circumstances, ICE will not raid a church. 
Now, I'm not giving you a policy that's like some, you don't have to be a lawyer to figure this out. You can Google it and read the ICE policy yourself. This is my challenge to you. Why not open up your church as a sanctuary? Why not say to people who are, have good reason to be afraid, if you are afraid, come and live in our church, we will turn our sanctuary into a real sanctuary. What do you say? Oh yeah, a thousand reasons not to. I know, people are complicated. You know, who wants to deal with people? For goodness sake. Look at Jesus. He dealt with people. How'd it turn out for him? <laughs> Folks, enough with the sermons already. Enough with the blah, blah, blah. People are being hurt right now across this country. Many of them are our brothers and they're our sisters. And we stand by with our churches empty when they could be sanctuary sanctuaries. Conclusion. Many of us look back on history and we say, if we were alive during the time of the slave, slave times, we would have been part of the Underground Railroad. Oh yeah, that would be me. Really? Would you? I mean, you could lose your house, you could go to jail. Are you serious? Would you do that? John Byington, the first General Conference president, did it. But would you? Really? People say, hey, but during the Nazis, haha, I would have been rescuing Jews. Would you? Would you really? And risk being pulled up by the Gestapo, sent to a concentration camp yourself? Would you do it? You'll say, oh, but if I was in with Martin Luther King in the Civil Rights Movement, I would have been marching in Alabama. I would have done this and I would have done that. I would have looked down the police dogs and I would have taken the fire hoses and I would have risked my life. Would you? Honestly, look at yourself in your hearts. And if you had, wouldn't, and if you couldn't, if you refused to, what does your Christianity mean? The answer is it's very easy to have the right answers for people in the past, right? It's safe. Everything's settled. We don't live in the past, friends. We live now. And if you're silent now, mark my words, you would have been silenced then when the stakes were a lot higher. Don't kid yourself. Don't kid yourself. And don't pretend that you can have some kind of private piety and have no public ramifications of that piety. Martin Luther King Jr. said this. Some people think, oh boy, you know, we'll just be silent because silence is neutrality. But as you know, silence is not neutrality. Silence is complicity. Martin Luther King Jr. said, in the end, we won't we won't remember the words of our enemies. We'll remember the silence of our friends. There's a book written by a friend and colleague of Nick and myself, named Zach, Bl Zach Plantak. It's called The Silent Church. And in it, he documents the number of times when the Seventh-day Adventist Church was silent in the face of a moral crisis in society. Friends, I don't want to be a member of a silent church. I want to be a member of a church that has the guts to stand up and speak out for those who are demarginalized and put down people who nobody else has the guts to stand up for. I want to be part of a church that stands up like Jesus stood up for the people who were pushed down. I don't feel any energy here today at all. I think people are thinking, yeah, but got things to do. I get that. But friends, don't kid yourself. We all one day give account for what our lives were on this earth. And I hope every one of you will be able to give an account that says, like Jesus, I followed the gospel all the way through 
from private piety to public action. Now, some of you will have heard me this morning and would have said, that guy is totally out to lunch. He makes me angry, and uh, he's wrong about a whole bunch of stuff. That's good. It means that you're actually listening. I've got no problem with that. Disagreement is not the worst thing that can happen. You understand that, right? That's fine. Come back here this, after, this evening, 6.30. 6.30, this conversation, I'm kicking off the conversation. This is just the beginning. Some of you listened to me and said, this stuff is uh, confusing and confronting, and I don't know what I think about it. That's good. Come back this afternoon, this evening, 6.30, and join the conversation. We have some of the most eminable, incredibly thought-provoking speakers in this entire country. Jim Wallace, who I don't agree with on everything, which is fine, but I agree with on many things, will be here. This guy is an amazing speaker. You have amazing uh, people coming in. Dr. David Trim, one of our friends and colleagues, who's one of the most stimulating people you will ever hear. Come back, be a part of the conversation. One final thing, adra.org slash inschool. Don't forget to sign up. Be a part of your voice. Thank you. Yes! And tell your friends to, too. Thank you so much for your time and attention. God bless. <laughs>